Stage Turner Awards. Thank you everyone for joining our webinar, which is Could, you, Could Your Book Become a Film? with LA Film Scout Stephen Hodges. Uh, you can get your work in front of Stephen by entering the Page Turner Awards. Before I introduce Stephen, I'm just going to quickly tell you that if you want to put any questions to Stephen, at the bottom, just hover over your screen. At the bottom of your screen is a little Q&A and just pop your questions in there and um, we'll, we'll ask those questions um, of Stephen. So welcome Stephen and uh, it's lovely to Hi. have you here with us today. Thank um, you so much. Stephen is a writer, a producer and a director who has worked on some of the largest films in Hollywood, including The Matrix series and Battleship. He's an executive producer, a development executive with experience that ranges from a lead role inside the world's largest toy manufacturer to an entrepreneur running a production company creating diverse original IP. Stephen is hard at work on creating the magic proof. Animated, it's an animated children's series with empowering characters, children to embrace diversity and love their differences. Stephen is a graduate of Arizona State University with degrees in intercultural communication and broadcast journalism. And Stephen has several projects in development. He's dedicated to continuing to develop and create media that celebrates diversity and inspires audiences to see themselves. So thank you so much, Stephen. Lovely to have you here with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You make me sound very impressive. <laughs> you are very impressive, I have to say. <laughs> um, okay, so should we dive straight, in, straight into the questions? Sure, of course. Okay. Um, I see loads of questions popping up on the screen. So I'll go with um, the one that I think so far is, looks like it's the most popular. So how do you get an agent or get your work exposed to the right people in a production company? Sure. So that's a really interesting question. And I think um, while it might seem the most relevant, it's probably not the most important um, because there is, a, I'm a pretty straightforward person and I wish I could tell you that there was a roadmap, but there really isn't. Um, so it's, uh, there's a lot of networking involved. There's a lot of um, um, hustle involved, um, having good work and that type of thing. And the system isn't uh, what I would call the entertainment industry isn't a one size fits all approach. So um, if you have a book with uh, a published uh, product, uh, a regular production company versus self-published. Um, sometimes those, those, I'm sorry, not production company publisher. Um, those publishers will have an avenue for you to do that. Um, if you're self-published, it's a lot more uh, footwork on your end. So, uh, what you do. Um, it'll end up in front of the right people. Um, it's, it's, it's unfortunately there's a system um, and sometimes they're a hindrance and sometimes they're a help. Uh, so I think probably the best way to answer that is to answer more questions from people, but also at the end, I actually have a, a list of like 10 tips, very practical tips that everybody can apply um, and towards that end, if that helps. Great. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yes, we're very lucky because Stephen's going to give us his ton, top 10 tips on um, on how you can get into the business. So stay around, stick around for that at the end of the session. Um, we have a question from Laure who's saying, um, what should a writer let go of when talking about film rights? What should they hold on to? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? My headphones died and I just went to regular audio, so I missed part of the question. Yes, okay. No problem. So we, uh, Laura, who's online, is saying, what should a writer let go of when talking about film rights and what should they hold on to? Uh, it, uh, regarding negotiation, I'm guessing. Um, I guess that's not an easy question to answer in the sense that your if you're first time uh and you're first time selling something chances are good you're not going to get much of any rights uh you if you're just trying to get in the door and you have multiple submissions uh and this is your first script chances are good someone will write it or i'm sorry someone will buy it um you'll get your money 
uh, and that's about all you'll get. You won't necessarily get creative control uh, or anything along that line. Um, if you if there's something specific that you want to hold on to, uh, or you um, like if you want to hold on to some form of creative control, chances are good that's not going to happen simply because as the writer, you're providing material. Uh, if you get farther along in your career uh, and end up becoming one of the producers of television show or film, uh, you can retain more creative control, work with the producers and the directors to make sure that it's still your vision on the screen. Um, with regards to financial rights, uh, if you possibly can, uh, especially if it's your first time, um, get as get as much um, well, get as much money as you can, obviously. But the other thing is to is to use that opportunity with the people that you have to maybe look into getting a. It could be something called a first look deal, which is essentially a, a production company will have uh, rights to look at all your next set of stuff. Um, and then the other thing would be to see if there's anything on the back end, back end meaning uh, once the movie makes money, do you make a certain percentage off of that? So um, as a first timer, you're probably not going to get much of much of anything except your pay, uh, but it's a credit and it's important. Uh, that's another thing. Um, try and hold on to your credit, make sure that they don't just buy your thing. And then, um, and then when it comes up on the big screen, uh, writer is your name. Um, cause having a credit, of course, gets you farther along in the industry. Yes, yes. No, I think that's great if, if you put your name on, on a film. So, um, that's a very, that's a very good question. And, uh, thanks to Laurie for that. Bill Johnson is asking, and it's, it's similar to what you've been talking about here, Stephen. How do you protect your IP if it's being offered around? Yeah, so protecting IP is really interesting and I've gone through that. Um, the first thing I would say is this. Uh, a lot of people won't submit their material, et cetera, uh, because they because they believe that someone will steal it. And while that is de has definitely happened in the, the industry, I would say 95% of the time, you shouldn't worry about that that much because no one's going to see your stuff if you don't submit it. Um, and number two, um, I know we all want to think that we're all the most original people in the world, but again, 95% of the time, your idea, not how you've executed it, but the idea itself has probably been done in some way, shape or form, uh, whether it's been in the past or whether somebody else has a similar script, a similar book concept, et cetera, et cetera. So concentrate on how you execute the idea. Um, the other thing is, is um, from a book standpoint, at least in the United States, if you write something, even if it's self-published, it's, it's already covered under copyright law. Um, and uh, some ways you can protect screenplays, at least in the US, and I think this works internationally, is you can actually register material online uh, with the Writers Guild, the WGA, www.wgawest.com. That's, that's the one in Los Angeles. The East Coast version is in New York. Um, and you can submit treatments, you could submit screenplays, that type of stuff. And it's sort of a uh, it's not foolproof, but it's a layer that show, they'll give you like a registration number and you can at least point to this, this is yours. Um, and then if it's a book and just book material, um, obviously if you do it with publisher, uh, they already, you're already protected by that. If you're self-published, most self-publishing companies, I think even Amazon have, uh, has like a section of rights, if you will, um, and just study those carefully so that you know uh, what is protected and what isn't and what isn't copyrighted and what is. Um, if you, I know we have a lot of people that are in foreign countries here and I'm not familiar with all of the copyright laws in those countries. I'm going to guess that unlike the UK, unlike the US, or, or unlike, say, France or Germany, um, so, uh, so if you're born in an Eastern uh, European country, they probably don't have as strict of copyright laws. So I would definitely look into um, seeing if you can register it in some way, shape, or form, either with an entity in the US or with uh, an entity probably in the UK. I think they have pretty good publishing rights as well. A couple of people are asking um, about getting a book series made into a film. Gaia and a couple of others, I see Gaia and then two three other people saying, how do I get a, um, my book or my a script um, or, or a series, a book series made into um, a film? Do I collaborate with a, a screenwriter or do 
who I just pitch it directly to the production company and hopefully they take it up as a series rather than a film. All right. Um, well, I, let's see. So the, well, there is unfortunately no one way to do it. Um, if you're looking to, uh, if you're looking to get turned into a film, I would strongly recommend that you uh, write a really good treatment and a really good synopsis of what you're doing. If you want to know how to write a treatment or uh, what people are looking for with regards to the information you're supposed to put in, uh, my suggestion is, is that you go online. There are a ton of resources on, and, and there's no one size fits all. Um, usually it includes a character breakdown. Uh, it includes a certain amount of, of scenic quality and that type of stuff. Uh, and um, uh, I think that I think that that's the most important thing. If you want to team up with somebody who's an established screenwriter or even someone who's good at screenwriting, I think that it's it's always helpful uh, because again, it's a book series could be a TV show or it could be a film. So understanding whether or not you want a one off uh, or whether or not you want a series of films, etc., is very important. Um, but also um, learning to write, uh, learning script writing is very different from learning. Uh, from learning from writing a book. And it's helpful to understand that because if you understand the difference between the two, um, even if you're not the best writer of scripts, uh, it's it's very helpful to know the craft so you understand what people are looking for. Um, and then of course, if you can partner up with a production company or uh, or an agent or basically whoever you can find, someone who's very interested in your material. Um, I'll talk about that at the end of the, uh, about the tips, but basically, um, yeah, that, that would be the best way to go. But I would start with, what do you want this to be? Do you want it to be a film? Do you want it to be a TV series? And then I would write a treatment as such so that you have in your head uh, where you're going. Right. Uh, another question has come up. I work in a studio doing creative marketing and all the creative execs I've spoken to tell me I need to rep, to be a, I need a rep to be able to pitch to them, even if it's for a remake of our library movie. Is that just a studio rule? Does that apply to everyone in the world of pitches outside a studio? That's quite a complex one. Yeah, actually, um, you know what, that question came up, I think, um, in, in the list that you sent me. Um, and I'm really glad you asked that question because it kind of pisses me off. Not that you asked the question, it actually pisses me off that uh, the creative executive that you're talking about told you that. Um, the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason I say that is, is because uh, they're using that as a tool to basically in my opinion, to put you off. So um, if they're a creative executive at a studio and you're adapting something that's already part of their IP, they should be thanking their lucky stars for you in the first place. That in my opinion, the creative executive is not doing their job uh, because they should, they should literally, like they have somebody internally who's interested in something that, that of IP that they already own. So if this person is in fact adapting something that they have, that's so much easier for a studio to take on uh, it, than it is for to uh, get original material. Uh, so say you're, I don't know, I guess a good example would be say you're, uh, say they own Star Trek and they're, and you're rewriting something or you're adapting something of Star Trek that could be a new, new show. That should be something that they jump on. So my, my advice is twofold. Number one, I don't, uh, number one, no, I don't believe that that's indicative to, to just any studio. And number two, if you already work there, talk to other people besides the execs you're talking to and see what you can come up with uh, or see if somebody else is interested. Specifically talk to not necessarily the execs, but to um, their assistants or um, other people who might be more amenable to your cause because they think that when you're in that situation, you're actually in a really great situation in order to get something made. The only caution I would say is, is because they already own the IP, if you're adapting something, once again, protect yourself, make sure that there's something that you have or something that you can do to make sure that either you get the credit for the project, because again, they already own the IP. Uh, so it's going to be, and depending on what your work contract is with the studio, they might say anything that's developed in the studio, they already own. And so hence your work product is already owned by them, which means they may not pay you. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a line uh, with regards to how to do that. But my suggestion is, is talk to other people about it. If you're really passionate about it at the studio, 
um, that you know because you're already there. You're already halfway into people that can help you out um, that you wouldn't normally be. Um, creative executive is who told you that in my opinion is basically just blowing you off um they're using that as it's either a legal ploy uh, because they've been sued before or something like that but you're doing a creative executive a favor if you've already done half their job for them part of their job should have been looking at their old ip and seeing if there are other adaptations for it so i'm glad you asked that question and even that, yeah, had another one on man who's saying, um, what does it mean to waive my indemnity? And I've seen this on many screenwriting competition teas and things. Could you please explain it? I'm sorry, you kind of cut out there. Could you say that one more time? Oh, what waive my indemnity? It, yes, what does it mean to waive my indemnity? I've seen this on many screen screenwriting competition teas and teas. Could you explain it? Yeah. My understanding is is that basically when you're when you're um, I, I think what they're talking about is I think they're talking about the idea of similar ideas. So anytime you submit to an agent, a studio, uh, et cetera, et cetera, ninety five percent of the time they will have you sign some some uh, form uh, that basically says you are um, uh, we are not responsible if this is something that's similar to what we already have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a pretty standard boilerplate thing. Um, and what it just basically means is that they're covering themselves if, say, you come up with a show about a, I don't know, a talking cat, and uh, they also have somebody else came up with a show about a talking cat that they already have in the production pipeline that you can't come back and say, oh, this is, you know, this is the same show. In other words, you, your material and what you submit has to be it's very difficult to win if you get into lawsuit situations. It's very difficult to win uh, uh, battles for IP for intellectual property because there's a lot of stuff that is so similar. But if you're if if yours is sufficiently um, if your thing is sufficiently creative and et cetera et cetera, uh, then you shouldn't have a problem. But the bottom line is is that anytime you submit, most likely you'll have to sign a form uh, regardless that says. If they're developing something that's similar to yours uh, and they develop it, then you don't have any rights to that. And so it's you have to look at the specific language, and if the language makes you uncomfortable, then I suggest you don't submit. But for the most part, it's pretty general boilerplate, and if yours is uh, sufficiently original enough, then you shouldn't have a problem. Um, Auntie Matty is asking, when Googling how to submit a pitch for a TV, a site called Greenlight My Movie keeps coming up, and he's asking, is it a legit site, Greenlight My Movie? Have you heard of that? Um, hmm. You know what? I haven't heard of that particular site. My guess is is that actually something along the lines of that in the tip section. Um, my, um, I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds a little sounds a little shaky. Um, I would do some research as to who's actually behind that. Um, and when it comes to green lighting things, there are so many different things along the way uh, to getting something green lit. Um, in reality, what it should be saying is, uh, is somebody willing to buy your material and put it into development? Um, because the development process can take anywhere from uh, six months to one month to five years to people sticking something on a shelf and never using it. So um, it's a question of uh, what are they actually offering you? But stuff like that to me always seems a little a little janky, if that makes sense. Yeah. Another question is: um, I was asked for a six-month exclusive with a well-known production company, but there was no offer of compensation. Is that usual? Um, yes and no. So if you're a first time person and you don't have a track record uh, or um, people in the industry who are really uh, who are really on to you, uh, it sounds like what they did is they offered you an option agreement 
uh, and an option agreement is just basically saying they'd like to de develop your material further. And a lot of times, no, that does not come with compensation. Uh, and then uh, op most standard option agreements also have some form of extension of term. So um, the good news about option agreements is if somebody's interested in your stuff, uh, the bad news is, is that it also ties up your stuff usually exclusively with said production company. Um, so if you're uh, looking for the opportunity, it's always nice to have to say that somebody has optioned something, even if they don't um, do it. But um, first time people normally, yeah, there's no compensation involved. Um, and then sometimes there will be an extension on contract that does involve compensation if you're really interested. If somebody does offer you compensation, that means they actually really, really are interested. And in so that's actually a good thing. Um, but it's not something that's uh, people. Uh, People don't normally get that a lot unless you're more established. Another question, how to get a critique on the screenplay? Uh, how to get a critique? Yes, um, the uh, well, let's see, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, there's, um, obviously you can ask friends and family. Uh, my suggestion is that you always start with people that you know and who you trust who will give you an honest opinion of your work. Um, and then if you wanted to go to, uh, for services, there are a lot. And uh, one of my tips is for with your money because people will charge you a lot of money for critiques. And unfortunately, opinions are, uh, are very disparate across the industry because it depends on taste. Um, my suggestion is, is to, if you do find a service or if it's something you want to look into, uh, find a service or find somebody you trust who um, you believe actually knows the business of the business as opposed to just, hey, I'm a screenwriter and I wrote 20 screenplays. None of them got produced, but I wrote 20 screenplays, which is great if you wrote 20 screenplays, but if nobody produced them, then it's kind of like, well, then do you really know the industry or is this writer the best person to um, talk to? Uh, not to disparage that person from writing because you know it's, it's hard to get in, but at the same time, um, somebody that you trust um, and then I will throw out one plug, and this is only because I've uh, used her before, but the name of Men Santi, uh, and she has, it's called the Gender Sand Consultancy, and if I can get the website information, which I had a second ago, but lost, but it's G, let me just look it up real quick, because I want to make sure I get the name right. Um, uh, Jen Grisanti, G J E N G R. I apologize if it gets repetitive with me just saying. I think the actors are so good in the scene, but I think the actors are so good in the scene. Both Adam and Daisy. Um, huh? This is just. Such oh, my apologies. That's me. Oh, sorry that's about that. <laughs> I wonder and, who that was. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, sorry about that. I'm like, who's who's talking about film stuff? Uh, Jen Grisanti. So J E N G R I S A N T I. And so Jen Grisanti actually offers. Uh, not just critiques on on scripts, but she actually offers a full um, writing your first screenplay class, and it's uh, live classes. And she's not particularly cheap, but she's a former studio exec, and she's really really good on her notes. And she specializes in television, uh, but she does have uh, that's just one I would recommend. But if you're going to spend money on something like getting your script critiqued, uh, my suggestion is that you do it with. Um, more reputable people than just, you know, any old person online, because there are a lot of people that offer that service and you can spend a lot of money on that. So again, you don't necessarily have to use Jen. There's a lot of others, but take a look at their credits. Uh, take a look at the last time they actually did something in the industry or got something made uh, and see if their style is, see if they write similar style to what you actually write. So um, submitting a sci-fi script to, someone who does romantic comedies is probably not your best bet just because they may or may not know that side not that they can't give you helpful notes on your romantic comedy or on your sci-fi script it's just i feel like it's helpful to be in the same sort of arena so that you because these people know then they've sold these things so they know uh, what people are looking for as well yeah yeah that makes sense yeah somebody's just saying is anyone having trouble with audio breaking up on the on the webinar Apologies for that if we do have a bit of breakage and a bit of buffering here and there. Um, I, I'm not sure why that is, but hopefully the rest of this webinar will be very plan and we won't have any distractions. We have another question. Um, if unpublished work is made into a film, can the author still have a copyright? And 
and if so, are the orphans like that? I think that's probably if it hasn't been published and it's getting to the stage of being published, can it be made into a film at the same time as, um, as the book is published? But to me, I mean, I, I could be wrong, that might be, because as you were saying a few weeks ago, Stephen, it could take years before, um, you know, a, a script gets into actually production. So maybe the, the normal production process might actually um, take much longer than a book publishing Maybe I'm wrong on that. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think, um, I, again, it's always kind of a chicken and chicken and the egg thing. So I think, um, you know, if you have something that's unpublished, uh, really at that point, if it's unpublished, I think you need to decide where you want to go right now. If you want to write a book, um, if you've written a book, um, then my suggestion is, is that you get it published, even if it's self-published, because it's always, because it's, it's not just a question of, uh, what the material is it's a question of the work you put in and somebody else sees that you put in to do so um if you want to turn it into a tv series or you just specifically want a tv series then I, my suggestion is then write the scripts uh because they didn't because they think that uh again they're they're twofold i my project my children's project started out as i specifically wanted to make it a tv series and realized that in order to um uh to get it out there I wrote the books as proof of concept. So the books themselves were, were actually a means to an end. Um, and now it turns out that the books are actually the thing that have gotten me to the place I have, where originally I thought it would just be the material that I created, the characters and everything else. So um, have all of the information, but then decide, uh, uh, but then decide what, um, uh, what you wanna do with it really. And my suggestion is, is if you truly wanna make it a book, uh, make the book, it, it, it couldn't hurt because you're just fleshing out characters for future material anyways. Uh, but with regards to one or the other, it's just, it's just completely dependent on what you wanna do and uh, how it gets exposed. I've got somebody asking um, about science fiction TV. It says, I feel like 70s to 90s generation are missing adventures where you can familiarize with characters and become has the trend changed over the millennia? If so, what are TV and film currently looking for? Um, so I'm trying to parse what they mean. Uh, I'm looking at the question, it's anti-mati. Um, yes. Let's see. Um, so the 70s or 90s generation are missing adventures where you can familiarize with the characters. Um, you know what I think it is really is uh, people from my generation, so I'm Generation X, uh, we have a lot of pop culture, uh, specifically in the US, but even uh, the UK and other countries um, that we grew up with. So Star Wars is a great example, um, and Marvel Comics, and basically everything that Disney owns. Uh, so, and now people are starting to mine that old IP and they're continuing to just either generate uh, more, more intellectual property off of that. Disney is very good at that, especially with Star Wars. Uh, and, but if you're asking whether or not we're missing new stuff now, as in as we get a little older, we're missing new people and new um, people that our kids can grow up with. Um, I think my... I don't have kids, but I mean, <laughs> uh, people's kids can grow up with. Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, the industry right now is all is constantly looking for the next thing, right? Um, I one of the most popular children's cartoon series right now is still SpongeBob SquarePants. SpongeBob SquarePants has been on TV for over twenty years, uh, if you can believe it. Um, and so, uh, one of the one of the problems with that is is um, I don't think that it's a lack of characters or imagination or original things out there. Um, but a lot of things, uh, when they're developed by the people who create them, they're either a one-off uh, and they think that there's more legs there than there really are. Um, and that's a, it's difficult to gauge that. That's, there's no formula for that. Uh, again, using Star Wars as an example, George Lucas never thought Star Wars would turn into what it is. 
Um, it just sort of hit the right place at the right time. And and he's brilliant about the hero, uh, the hero's journey myth, and and incorporating certain things in his uh, ori in the original Star Wars that people immediately get. Uh, you you don't even know that that's the hero's journey if you're not familiar with the jargon. But when you watch it, it's extremely familiar to you know old Greek literature and everything in between. Um, so. Um, so I guess uh, if you're, the answer to your question is uh, kind of yes and no. I think the trend has changed because I think that unfortunately large production companies are looking for the next big thing, the next Star Wars, the next whatever, whatever, but they don't necessarily execute well um, because they're not always looking for the most original material because they're uh, because their their attention span is shorter, right? So if you think about it as a business, they're looking for money or the money that happens now as opposed to you know something like star wars you can see going on forever and ever and ever but that's because they put the effort into it so um so yeah i think uh it has changed um but i also think that it's changed not necessarily because there isn't good stuff out there i think it's changed because there's a lot more access to stuff out there uh there's a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily as good and um and people that are uh promoting it or creating it don't necessarily, or uh, specifically like studio people, creative people don't have an understanding of why something is as good as it is. I could go on a rant with you about creative executives and studios, but I won't uh, because, you know, someday we probably still want to work with these people anyways. But um, the bottom line is, is I think that there is, uh, there is a shift. And also we have a cultural shift going on as well, a pretty massive cultural shift, probably the biggest cultural shift since World War II uh in um storytelling so uh world war ii kind of gave a template for uh and and the baby boomer generation gave us a template all the way up to like the late 70s going into the 80s but as you go into the 90s the 2000s the 2010s the 2020s we've got a massive world shift with regards to what's going on uh people are um uh, young people are have completely different trends. They have to deal with different things in school. Uh, they have to deal with uh, different realities than I did when I was going to when I was in grade school. And so I think that um, you have to figure out what works for your generation, if you will. Uh, and I think that also attention spans are shorter. And also, there's just a lot more content out there. So something like Breaking Bad is a perfect example of a great series, a great thing that hit the zeitgeist right at the exact same time it was supposed to hit. Um, but even though there's Better Called Saul, they wrapped it up. They, you know, they ended that. There's, there's really no way to take Breaking Bad and, you know, turn it into a Star Wars. So, because it's just, that's not the way it's written. So, um, if you're writing for an eye for the future or for uh, different things, that it's something to consider as to what your ultimate le legacy is. Do you want a really fantastic TV series that wins, you know, that is part of the cultural zeitgeist, but it's just one thing, and then you move on to your next thing? Or are you looking to build the next Star Wars? And um, that's a very different mindset with regards to writing. That's probably way too long of an answer. Very good, thank you. I'm oh, sure it's easy. <laughs> uh, somebody's asking about a recording. Yes, we are doing a recording of the session, which I'll send out in the next day or so. Hopefully by tomorrow I'll send it out. So, uh, yes, John, to hear some of the recording. Another question, Stephen. What is the most common mistake that authors or writers typically make that results in an automatic no? Ah, I've got a great answer of that, and it's actually in my tips at the end. Ah, okay. So we keep that one then. Okay. Yep. Um, another one, are the things look for in a book that would make, um, that would be adapted for TV or streaming different to what you look for in a book that could be adapted for film? Uh, different things that can be adapted. I'm sorry, one more time. Uh, so, yeah, so are the things you look for in a book that could be adapted for TV slash streaming different to what you look for in a book that could be adapted for film. So I imagine what they're saying, TV streaming, I imagine they're saying, so are there different things in a, um, in a book that could be adapted for a TV series or could be adapted for a film? So kind of yeah. like the difference between 
Yes. Especially if you have a book. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, a book. Well, there's a lot. Of, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of different things. Um, the one thing would be if it's a TV series, you have to support, uh, you know, 13 hours uh, between 10 and 13 hours. If it's a drama in one season, uh, whether it's streaming or whether it's on cable or a network show, um, a, a film is a one off. So uh, depth of material, um, where can I go with these characters? Uh, and, and, and do they have legs? And does the writer know that as well? Have you, have you written your book and then gone, well, you know, you could also do this, 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 and this. If it's a, you know, if it's a one-off series about a murder and somebody gets murdered and then that's the end, then there's probably not that far you can go. If it's a detective uh, that's solving multiple murder mysteries, then yes, there's, it's much, there's much farther you can go. Um, the other thing, uh, the other thing to consider is, um, uh, well, the way production is done between the different mediums, uh, you know, um, television series and streaming for the most part, unless you're a, a large, uh, a large series, um, that's on Netflix or something like that are going to have higher budgets. Um, but chances, but most of the time streaming, uh, they have lower budgets. Um, so you have to look at, I, I say this in the tips at the end, but you basically, you have to know the medium that you're writing for. So it's not just, oh, I wrote a book, now turn this into a television series. It's no, it's an all encompassing knowledge of how the industry works um, to try and figure out where you fit. Um, the other thing from a streaming standpoint is, is that there's a lot of platforms now that are uh, working with different types of content, uh, including, um, it's not really new, I and mean, this has been happening on YouTube for years and years, but in the time of COVID, uh, people are looking at a lot of different types of things, including short form, so stuff that's less than uh, 10 or 15 minutes long, uh, that, that are broken down as almost a serialized uh, storylines. Um, and then you've got uh, a startup called Quibi, which is started by Jeffrey Katzenberg, uh, former exec at Disney and DreamWorks, uh, who's not doing very well right now, but for other reasons. Uh, but they are literally looking at short form content that's uh, with big name stars that's installments of like five minutes or less, because they're talking about just everybody watching it on their phone on the subway or something along that line. So um, these are considerations that I always think as a writer, you should have in your head after you write your masterpiece, uh, you should you should do some research to see where you want this to go, um, because you're the you're going to be the one ultimately who's leading who's ever reading your material. You can't expect necessarily to someone to read your book and go, oh, this would make an, a great TV series or this one because people are reading so much stuff. I, I think it's important that you have a handle on where you think it can go and why. Joe wonder exactly saying what you were saying a few minutes ago about the um, it was really interesting about the cultural shift and they see and Joe Wonder please thank you. And the question is what about new hybrid medium for live storytelling and animation and pictures? Could this be the future for publicity as I am a live storyteller as well? Yeah, so actually I think uh, is it Joe Wonder? Uh, Joe Wonder. Woodward. The one um, is probably yeah. my spirit animal. Um, it's a really great question. Uh, and the reason I say you're my spirit animal is because I'm actually doing this right now with my children's book series. So uh, from an exposure standpoint, there's there are a lot of hybrid mediums. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do things. Um, and live storytelling is making a huge comeback, specifically in this medium, because if you're working on children's stuff, for example, uh, kids are at home and uh, their parents don't know how to educate them and they're basically uh, and the school systems at least in the US aren't they don't have enough stuff for kids to do at home so you're seeing a lot of uh, visual storytelling um, I wish I could remember the name but there's a uh, there's some great stuff on like TikTok and um, and on YouTube uh, with these educational videos that are you know, really well put together um, that aren't necessarily the norm. Um, and I think you're seeing a lot more um, animation, especially with kids stuff, animation interacting with humans, uh, because uh, kids right now are no longer, especially now, I'm literally working on this, so I'm trying not to wax too poetic on it, but basically um, 
kids are being very much affected by uh, not being able to go to school, not being able to be social with their friends, uh, and not being able to, like, and, and there's really no end in sight. Even when kids go back to school, no matter what country you're in, we're living in a new normal now. Uh, there's not going to be as much social interaction. You may see limited, you, you may see limited um, uh, interaction on, on when kids go outside on playgrounds and stuff like that. So yes, I think there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of movement towards that. And I think there's a lot of opportunity towards that. Um, and, li and live storytelling, pictures, all of that stuff, uh, you're going to see an increase of that coming up shortly because right now, as much content as there is, is out there on Netflix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, everybody's running out of content. Uh, and live action stuff, is going to be behind by two to three years because no no studio can shoot live action. But you know what you can shoot uh, uh, in a, in an all computer environment, uh, networking over Zoom and whatever is animation. You can create animation uh, and you can create hybrid stuff uh, with smaller footprints of crews uh, than you can a big studio movie right now. So I think it's an excellent question, and uh, you're absolutely right. It's definitely a space to watch. Thank you, dear Robert, for that question. Another one, uh, I completed a fiction approaching literary aging. Should I get professional review? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one. Say it one more time. I completed a fiction approaching literary agents. Should I get professional reviews for the work to qualify? Um, <clears throat> I, you know what? It doesn't hurt. Uh, but again, I would do it wisely. Do your research on who you're getting uh, professional covers from. Um, make sure they know uh, your genre. Uh, make sure they seem to know what they're talking about. And um, if you're going to do it, I would get two or three because I think it's always helpful to get uh, differing opinions. Uh, but don't get 20. I don't think there's a reason to do that. Um, and don't, um, and, and always, uh, always sort of follow up um, and, and that would be my suggestion. But yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it hurts. Um, we're nearing the end of time and I know we still want to hear your top tip, so I'll give you one more. Um, this one is, um, I assume it's from somebody in the UK. Are publishers in the UK actively seeking to secure full rights for their authors or is an author not to depend on the publisher for that? Uh, yeah, so it depends on your publisher, um, but my but the publishing industry and this is no offense to anybody, um, the publishing industry is uh, going through massive shifts right now, and they they actually don't really know what's going on. And this has been uh, and I don't say that harshly because I have a publisher, um, but you're you're always your um, they're trying to figure out how things are going digital versus most people don't read physical books anymore. Um, and it's very difficult to get anything that they would consider a bestseller. Uh, and they, um, they look for material, but I think that the, um, publishers are kind of going the way of what streaming is right now, which is they're going more towards niche. So very specific niche uh, stuff that may not reach everybody, um, but you're always your biggest cheerleader. So uh, um, unless you've got a bestseller, um, at one of the largest publishers, uh, the chances are good that they're they're not putting a lot of effort into making your book, uh, getting your book in front of people to uh, form into a TV show or a film or anything like that. My suggestion is, is that you do as much of it on your own as possible. You're your biggest cheerleader. You're the one who knows your material the best. Um, and, and, and it's really incumbent on you to do the legwork. Um, as frustrating as that is, uh, it's also rewarding because you also control the process to a certain extent, um, and you can do as much work or as much little work on it as you want. Great. Just one last quick one. Um, is it better to get to go directly to a full production company or to get a full scout like yourself to see the work first? Uh, it, it completely varies. Uh, uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's more dependent uh, on contacts and who you know. Um, and then there's a lot of people, there's a lot of independent producers who 
um, you know, are hustling just like you. So a, a, a independent producer's job, if they're all, if they're not a creative per se, uh, like you are, or if you're like me and you're a creative and a producer, um, but if, if they're not a creative, then it's they're looking for stuff. Absolutely. Um, the question is, is what can they what can they accomplish with it? So, say you've met an independent producer and you really like them and you guys get along and they see your vision. Then my next question would be vet them and hold them accountable to what they're doing or not doing with your project. Um, I would always get some form of shopping agreement with them or some sort of piece of paperwork that says, you know, uh, you've got six months when you, you know, that's to do and that's to protect them as well. So uh, anybody who just says, hey, I'm going to take on your project without getting you a piece of paperwork that says what they're going to do. Um, Eh, I'm a little iffy on that because I just don't necessarily, it's not that I haven't done stuff on spec before, but I think that, um, but I know that I'll actually, I, I would only take something on if I was actually interested in it. So you don't want to just submit to everybody and have people take out your stuff because they may or may not be doing you a service. And if you're tied up with some form of contract with them, that means you can't approach other people unless it's a non-exclusive. Uh, so I think that it's a, I, I, I think it's, who do you end up getting and then what's your relationship with them and then you kind of have to feel it out from there. Uh, Stephen, it's been great. Um, I know that you've got some fantastic tips for us. Um, so we, oh. uh, we'd we love it if you could jump into your tips and give us, uh, give, give us your top 10. I think it's, did you say it's top 10? Top 10 tips. Top tips. So top tips of what you, oh. how you think we should do. Okay, well, um, I apologize if my eyeline is up here because that's where the document is. So anybody, I'm, I'm actually looking at you guys, but I'm looking at my document. So hang on a second, let me find it. Uh, okay, so I just call these, I came up with these last night because I realized that uh, this made the most sense to me when while I've been working. So these are what I call Stephen's top 10 real world tips for navigating the process, uh, navigating this whole crazy, Entertainment industry, which, um, you know, you guys are here, which means you actually enjoy it. Uh, you could have easily become accountants um, and had a much cushier life and uh, less stress. Uh, but we've chosen to be creative, so that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, my first tip is what I call uh, learn the business of the business. So um, congratulations, you're a writer now. You've written a book. You've got an idea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, unfortunately, that's about that much of the work. Um, the real work is learning the business of the business. So um, you are now a producer, uh, you are now your own agent, uh, you are now your own salesperson um, until such time as you, even people that have the most successful careers in Hollywood are still hustling every day. Uh, you know, people like Ryan Murphy, people like Steven Spielberg, uh, yes, they have much less of a hustle, but uh, even Scorsese had to hustle to get the Irishman out. Uh, so, um, so my uh, thought process is uh, learn the business of the business. Uh, study how the industry works. Uh, what's the difference between making a film or a TV show or a web series? Uh, there are different considerations for that. Um, size of screen. Uh, so uh, it's a visual medium. So if you have a lot of wide shots and you're making something for a screen this big, uh, that's going to affect the production process. As a writer, it's important for you to explain this uh, and know your craft uh, so that you can, so that people can have a vision of how your show is going to get made. Not that you're going to do it all yourself. Um, understanding the business, uh, understand the main roles. Uh, what's a director do? What's a producer do? I know it sounds simple, but it's not as simple as you think. Uh, what's the writer? What's a writer's role? A screenwriter on a television, a writer on a television show is also a showrunner usually. Uh, they usually run the day-to-day -day operations of the show in the writer's room. Whereas if you're a writer on a movie, chances are good. You hand over your script, they pay you your money and, and you're done. Uh, that hasn't really changed that much unless you have somehow parlayed yourself into having a hand in production or uh, know the director. Um, know what the production uh, manager is. Uh, understand writer's rooms and how they work. Um, it might be a situation where you get to a point where you're, um, maybe this isn't your magnum opus. Maybe you write a book, but maybe you really want to be a writer in a writer's room. Um, that's completely different. Uh, it, that's, that's cranking out scripts, uh, becoming a writer's assistant. Um, understand the business. Um, the other thing about the business, because this is the most important one, 
uh, or this particular point is um, know the difference between managers and agents. To be honest with you, I still don't know the difference between managers and agents because they, they cross paths so much, but have a general working knowledge if you're working with people. Um, Know the different know the different production companies. Um, all of this stuff you can find online. It's it's and there's uh, uh, lots of really great sites that break some of this stuff down. Uh, know production companies. Know what they're producing. If you've got a romantic comedy, don't go to a company that mainly does reality shows. They're they're not going to know what you're talking about, and they're not going to buy your book anyways. Uh, you have to know who you're talking to. Um, know the landscape. Um, what's currently being made? What's currently on television? Uh, if you're writing science fiction, do you know what other science fiction shows are on television? And can you break them down? Uh, and why are they different from yours versus why are they the same? Uh, why will somebody buy, why will there be a rash of zombie movies being made all of a sudden? And then there's no vampire movies being made, et cetera, et cetera. Um, know what people are looking for and know what they're buying. Um, Know the different players, obviously, uh, not just the big people, but uh, smaller people, execs, names you may never have heard of before. Uh, those are the people you're probably going to be talking to. Um, keep an eye, again, so many great things on online. Um, keep an eye on the trades. That's one way to do it. Um, variety is the old standard. If you do kids stuff, look at kids screen. Um, but there's so many others you can literally Google. You can literally Google, you know, what are the different trades, and there's a bunch of them. There's medium.com. Uh, there's there's ones for advertising. Uh, there's all. Um, understand economics, uh, the economics of how films are made, uh, how they make their money, uh, whether they make their money, how web series are made, et cetera, et cetera. Have a basic understanding of budgets uh, because you can write something that is taking place uh, in the uh, Himalayas um, and think you absolutely have to shoot in the Himalayas, chances are good you're not gonna be shooting in the Himalayas. Uh, so um, understand that your story will affect the way somebody looks at it uh, as a way of whether or not they're going to buy it uh, based on who they are. Not that you can't, uh, and I always say shoot for the moon, uh, but at the same time, you have to understand that there will be compromises or things you have to change along the way. So be flexible in the way your story is made uh, because sometimes those challenges create the greatest opportunities on screen. Uh, and the other, and the other thing um, that I would say is if, if you're living in a foreign country, not necessarily the UK, yes, basically any other country than the United States. I know it might seem really fantastic uh, to get something in front of uh, American producers in Hollywood, et cetera, et cetera. But the coolest thing is, is that we're moving towards, we are already there, but the film industry is really moving much more towards a global economy of scale with regards to production. If you uh, live in say like Estonia, um, chances are good uh, you're going to be able to meet people in some ways better than I will because there's a lot of production that shoots there. Um, you, you can be a smaller fish in a smaller, you can be a bigger fish in a smaller pond, uh, because a lot of countries are really are doing their own production right now. And you can be at the forefront of that either for their own local niches, or, uh, you'll have productions coming in shooting for other countries, some stuff that's never even seen in the U S or the UK. Um, if you have a connection to say India, uh, have you looked into Bollywood? If you have a connection, in, uh, in the Middle East, um, Right now, um, Saudi Arabia is having a big push towards creating new content specifically for what's called the MENA region, which is Middle Eastern, Middle East, uh, so I can't remember the acronym, but basically, um, and, and that might just be regional, but people are really wanting stories and it's not going to stop. The industry actually, even though it's stopped for COVID right now, is this is showing that there are so many more angles and places you can go that you've never thought of, uh, that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of before. And yeah, it may not be that uh, Universal Studio, you're shooting on a lot of Universal Studios release worldwide in 100,000 theaters. Um, you don't necessarily need that at the beginning. If you're a creative and you wanna create stuff, there's opportunities out there for you. Um, that's only number one. Uh, number two, um, network. Network, network, network. I wish somebody would have told me this 20 years ago. Network with everybody. Meet everybody. Uh, you know, attend festivals if you can. Volunteer. Um, not necessarily that you're going to meet Steven Spielberg and hand him your screenplay, but 
you don't know where people are going to end up. You don't know who people are going to know. Um, the more people you talk to, the more of your tribe you create, create your own tribe of people, like-minded people who want to create stuff with you. Um, always, you know, look at film markets, look at, uh, um, know, and, and then of course, know the company that you're, you're talking to. If they make horror movies, they're not going to make your romance. Uh, make a list of who you know. Uh, even if your dentist knows Kate Winslet, that might be a path. It's probably not, but you never know. Uh, if you have the perfect project for Kate Winslet and you catch her on a particularly good day where the dentist is giving her drilling on her head, you just never know. Um, network, 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 and network is constant. And, and, and to be honest with you, a giant pain in the butt, but it's, but it's worth it. Um, uh, and then the next thing I would say is uh, keep your eye on trying to be a big fish in a smaller pond. Oh, the other thing is, is don't, when you're networking with people, if you're talking to, if you end up talking to executives in any way, shape or form at a pitch fest or something like that, don't just talk to the executives, talk to their assistants. Executives are busy. They got 5,000 other things to do. Half the time they don't even know what they're doing. No offense to executives who might be watching this, who want to uh, give me money someday. Uh, their assistants are gatekeepers. Uh, a good example is the uh, is the show um, uh, Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot would not have made it on the air if it weren't for the assistant of the guy who created it. The assistant of the guy is the one who got the original script by the original writer and is the one who pushed it to his boss so much that the boss finally relented and they made it into a show. So that's really important. It's not necessarily the people at the top. It's the people down here are the real gatekeepers. Um, and then, um, and use your money wisely. Um, there's a lot of research you can do on your own, but, uh, but my suggestion is, is don't spend huge sums of money on constantly getting, uh, you know, feedback or, or, um, from people that are giving you script advice and all of that stuff. Do your research on who you're giving your money to, because, uh, I know I could always use more and, um, it's a process, but that's, it's also part of putting skin in the game. Um, so if you're doing something like that, bet it wisely, um, uh, not to go back to Jen Grisanti, but a good example of something where it's a, it's a two for with her in the sense that she gave, it, she, she will not only help you with your first draft of your screenplay uh, through the course of a, of a program, which again is not particularly cheap, but she also gives you notes from an executive standpoint. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of a two for as opposed to somebody just giving you, Hey, I really like that you had this character that did X, Y, and Z. Um, and then this, conversation that I said I had a note for earlier, the cardinal sin, uh, what you should never ever do. Um, what you should never ever do at an event, specifically if you go to any event, whether it be a festival, whether it be a pitch fest, uh, whether it be whatever, well, pitch fest is you're actually pitching to people. If you meet somebody who's an executive, somebody who can actually make a decision, uh, pick your name because you would know who they are, don't ever, ever ask them if they'll do, if you can give them your script and if they will produce it because they get hit up every day by thousands and thousands of people and it's immediate red flag that you're a um that you're a newbie uh and the answer will be no so my suggestion is instead if you meet somebody like that especially if it's somebody you admire ask them for advice somebody will always 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 or and uh, take you up on an offer. I, you know, I really love your work. Um, I really admire what you do. And uh, um, could you please, could I take 20 minutes of your time at, in the future? I'll set it up with your assistant to just get 20 minutes of advice um, because you're establishing a relationship with people um, and you want to establish a relationship and you want to bring value. You don't just want to be that guy who's at the table who says, well, I don't understand why you don't just, you know, pick my script because it doesn't work that way and you're just going to get turned off. Um, you'll get a lot of rejection, obviously, uh, but you'll get a lot more rejection if you're just basically wandering around uh, with a chip on your shoulder saying, why don't you read my script? Um, so that's kind of the cardinal sin, know the context. And also, if you're going to meet somebody like that at a festival, et cetera, et cetera, do your homework. Uh, if you're, um, I did this uh, at a Producers Guild conference years ago, a producer by the name of Ronald D. Moore. Uh, Ronald D. Moore is executive producer and one of the creators of Battlestar Galactica, which I was dating myself a little bit. Uh, Battlestar Galactica, which was one of the best written shows on television about 10 years ago. Um, 
had a guy at a at a conference basically say why don't do the exact same cardinal sin and he just looked at him like he had two heads i ended up uh talking to him asking him for advice uh getting to know him understanding who he was realizing that we had the same birthday two years apart as an in uh ended up being able to talk to him multiple times on the phone uh and um while i didn't execute as well as i wanted to on that uh that was a pretty big deal for me at the time um Okay, so sorry I'm rambling, so I'll try and wrap it up. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, let's see, um, and I know everyone probably has to go. Uh, number three, know your stuff. Uh, when I say know your stuff, I mean know your stuff. Uh, who are your characters? Uh, what are their motivations? If you can't riff off the top of your head uh, anything about your story, your characters, what you're trying to accomplish, uh, what medium you want them on, uh, why they're more relevant than, it, than whatever else is in their genre, et cetera, et cetera, then you don't know your stuff. Know your story. You're the creator of your story and you're the one who's gonna know it better than anybody else. Nobody can pitch your story as well as you can pitch your story. So know your stuff and have moved beyond just your physical book to all of the different ramifications and the permutations of every character in your story because maybe your main protagonist isn't the most interesting. Maybe it's the sidekick who's the most interesting. And that's a way to turn a story, uh, create a screenplay around that, something along that line. Um, the other thing to know about your stuff is no standard industry stuff. Uh, write the best log line. If you don't know what a log line is, you need to Google it. If you wanna know how to create the best log line possible, Google it. It's very, very important because that's part of your pitch. Uh, log line is basically two sentences, two to three sentences max that encompasses your entire story that makes the other person go, wow, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Um, learn how to write a really good log line. Uh, and then, and hone your pitch. Uh, if you're going to pitch, you're always pitching, uh, to quote again, to date myself, but to quote, uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, always be selling and you're always selling. Uh, you always have a chance to represent your work. You don't know who you're going to run into even at the grocery store. Well, obviously, it's literally, you know, you just don't know. Um, but if people are interested in your story, even if it's somebody standing in line at the grocery store who has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the television industry, chances are good if that person likes your story, then other people will too, which means somebody who can actually get it made will. Uh, it'll make you a better writer. So hone your pitch, and your pitch can be... Uh, and get something down in your head that you can literally do in 30 seconds. And you can just roll it off. Um, and then also along that line, know your niche. Uh, if you're writing a sci-fi show uh, or a sci-fi movie, what are the, I call it, they're called constellation shows. Um, if you're writing Star Wars, uh, uh, if you're writing Star Wars, a constellation TV show would be Battlestar Galactica. Uh, if you're writing a romantic comedy, what are the things that are currently out right now uh, or, or things that are similar? It can't just be, hey, I've got a great story about a teacher. That's great. What are the other stories about teachers that are out there, with either in film and television, past, present, or future? Um, know your niche so that you can explain to somebody what your story is. It goes along with your pitch. Um, number six. We're almost there, guys. Sorry. Uh, know your audience. Uh, don't talk about your zombie project. To a guy who's a, a man, he's, they're, they're, they're not going to buy it. So they, they, they don't know that. So know your audience. Uh, know who you're talking to. Uh, when you're talking to people, if you're a children's book writer like myself, um, uh, I, I know who my audience is. I know the age range of who my characters appeal to. Um, know, so that you know what you're talking about. Always know your audience. And, and more importantly, do your research on whoever your audience is. So if your audience, if you are at a festival and you want to talk to people, who are the people that are going to be there you're going to be talking to? Your, uh, and also know the intricacies of what they like because Quentin Tarantino doesn't always like to talk about his movies per se, his movies. But if you want to talk about old pop culture references that he uses in his movies, yeah, he'll probably talk to you about that kind of stuff. Um, so know your audience. Um, number seven, write lots of stuff. Uh, uh, Written, uh, one fantastic book or one fantastic series that they think is the be all and end all and I think that that's fantastic and that's your passion but 
write lots of stuff because that might be the, that might not be the first thing you sell or the first thing you want to sell because if that's your only thing what happens if somebody buys it say here you go here's your money goodbye and then you have that money but then what's the next step um other things to think about is even if you don't run an entire book or an entire tv series et cetera, et cetera, for other stuff. Write synopses, ideas, uh, break down characters. Um, if you're so inclined, write spec scripts of your favorite TV shows, uh, you know, break down, uh, watch a TV show, whatever show you're watching at the moment. Uh, one I just binge watched is a show called Insecure on HBO. Break, break down the series per scene, understand how those things work and understand how things are written because you, you're trying to get something on TV or film. And even though you're trying to sell a book to these people, understanding those basics will help you write better stuff. Um, look at writing articles. Uh, if you're really into, again, sci-fi, obviously I'm a sci-fi geek. Uh, you might be able to get some articles published and that type of thing. It always helps. Uh, it helps your writing. It helps to sell you who you are. Uh, and it leads to other opportunities that you might not know. Um, and again, you could just write down stories, synopses, uh, you know, whatever's in your head. Um, I don't think I know anybody who's written a book, a TV show or anything else who has only one idea. Um, it just, that's not how creatives work. Um, number eight, look beyond the known. So look beyond the known. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to get things out there, uh, that you don't necessarily think of. Uh, it's not, it's kind of the wild, wild west right now. There are people doing some really interesting stuff on TikTok that they shoot themselves uh, that may or may not go anywhere and nobody may or may not see it, but it's part of the creative process. It keeps your brain in the creative space. Um, uh, look at places, uh, look at marketing. Um, there actually are a lot of story incubators for companies uh, that will create, that are looking for creative stories to tell in advertising for commercials. So if you can come up with a fantastic idea um, for how to sell Legos, um, you know, using a story-driven um, interface, there are companies that are looking for that. Um, Nike actually had a campaign um, not that long ago where they literally went out to, instead of to their agencies. Uh, yes, it was online. Yes, it wasn't a lot of money. But people created commercial ideas. They do that for the Super Bowl in the United States for commercials. Um, there's a company called Tongal, T-O-N-G-A-L. Uh, check them out, uh, look them up online. They're all about story-driven, um, creating campaigns for commercials and stuff. They don't pay a lot of money. Um, it's, it's kind of a pain because it seems like you're doing work, their work for free, but it gets you out there and you don't know where that can lead. Um, other things to look at beyond the known, um, Patreon, I don't know if you've heard of that. It's an online platform where, uh, People will pay creators uh, for their series uh, and stuff like that. Um, and there's so many other ones that I don't know. Again, depends on the use of your time, depends on how much time you have and what you ultimately want to succeed. So keep your eye on the ball, but don't dismiss opportunities until you've researched them because you never know what something might lead to. So look beyond the known. Uh, um, a really, really super good example for me personally is my children's book series is about a little girl with magic hair. The little girl is a girl of color. Um, I used to go, uh, she's a little girl who's uh, African-American. She's black. Um, I attended African-American hair shows. I'm literally the only white guy and the only male uh, who would attend African-American hair shows. And I have a pretty big following just from that. Uh, so that's what I mean by look beyond the known. Um, other things would be like charities are looking for stories and characters. Um, People are always looking for creative people to help them tell their stories. Um, so look beyond the known. Um, number nine, uh, know your motivations. Um, why are you doing this? Uh, do you just want to get a movie made because you want to make movies? Uh, do you do this because you love writing? Because I hope you do. Because writing is a thankless task um, that's usually done in people's basements uh, during long hours at the expense of things like sunlight and everything else. Um, why are you doing this? What's your goal? and keep your goal in mind. Uh, and that goal might change and that's okay, but why are you doing this? Uh, if you're doing this to get rich, um, my su suggestion is that uh, uh, probably bounce back out of COVID, um, go into the stock market. 
um, you're probably not going to get rich. Uh, but if you want to make a living doing this, then it's a, then it's a lot of work and it's a labor of love. And then if your stuff is good enough, of course, you're going to break through. So know what your motivations are. Really, really understand your motivations because that will keep you sane during this process. Um, number 10, the last one. Please, 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 I beg you, know your craft. Write good, uh, sorry for cursing, write good shit. Don't just know your craft. Know how to write a book. Uh, understand the conventions for writing the book. Understand uh, the conventions for writing a screenplay. Understand that a lot of stuff has already been done before. What's your breakout? What's your niche? Be good at your craft. Practice your writing because the only way you're going to get at the top of the heap is if you're ultimately, if you're a good writer and if you're a, a good story, a uh, good storyteller, uh, specifically in screenplays. Uh, if you're writing a screenplay is completely different book. The first thing I would look at is how visual is your story? Uh, you can write down, it was dark, stormy night. How is that going to be portrayed on film? Because you're not going to have a narrator on a, a film. Uh, so make sure it's visual. Make sure it's very, it has to be visual if it's a story that's told on film. Um, the other thing, know your craft, is know the nuts and bolts, right? Um, proofread, please. No typos. Uh, understand grammar. Uh, get good opinions from people. Understand formatting. Uh, if you don't format your script to, uh, in a certain way, the way that different companies have different formats of scripts, uh, if you don't understand the formatting and what they're looking for, they can look at your first page and they could say, this person didn't format it properly, done. You have about 10 seconds. Don't give them a reason to get rid of your material because you can't spell, because you have bad grammar, because you don't understand. Uh, if you're writing uh, and you're writing in a foreign language, I understand that the English translation might be difficult. If you're writing something that's a period piece, know the period. Please know uh, that um, dinosaurs did not exist uh, in uh, medieval England during uh, the Crusades. Um, Simple stuff like that, although that would be a good sci-fi show. But the bottom line is, is that know, your, know what you're talking about and do your research and just know your craft. That's it. <laughs> that was a lot. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve. And I'm sure everybody will join me in thanking Steve. And raise your hands and thank Steve. That was, that was I mean, the, the questions before, you know, just asked, I was asking and you were answering the question. That was brilliant. But... Your 10 tips was just amazing. There's so much in there that we can all take away. And I'm sure everybody's brains are full of all that good stuff. And everybody can take it away and just start thinking about how they can actually um, benefit from what you've told them today. And there's thanks coming in already. Loads of thanks coming in saying thank you so much. So, you know, thank you, Stephen. It's been wonderful having you. Um, everybody, don't forget, if you haven't, um, if you haven't joined page two, Got up until the 30th of June, and then Stephen will be judging the work as well as some other judges. Um, so if you've got any information you know, that you need to get in front of Stephen, some really good work, some really good writing, some of the stuff that Stephen was talking about, get your get your stuff onto page twenty.com. And um, hopefully Stephen will see your work there and hopefully, you know, he might really like something and contact you. So um, Thank you again, Stephen. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, fantastic. See you again soon. Take care. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks, Stephen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.